Hi, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to the 11th episode of the European Volleyball Show. And another great one here. We get to spend another entire episode breaking down, getting into the details of this second, or sorry, the women's superfinals match between Dakif Bank and Caneliano, one that we have been anticipating for so long. And today, as always, I am joined by Rob St. Clair. Rob, how are you today? Great, Dan. Thanks. Happy Friday. And you're not kidding, I think, since the very first episode of this show and before that, I think, since the end of 2020, at least, we've been hyping up this exact matchup and just kind of hoping that it would come true for the sake of the game of volleyball that we would get to watch this one match. And uh, it's it's almost here, uh, just over a week away. We finally get to see Vaku Fank and Canegliano do battle and, and on the biggest stage, it's exactly what we wanted, and we finally get to break it down. I'm excited. I know it's really going to be just a match of the Titans. I'm very excited for it. But before we get to that, we have a couple items to get through uh, today. The first is the FIVB uh, four-star uh, beach bubble happening in Cancun right now, where we have a lot of European teams competing at the highest level. If you haven't been following it, the way it works is that there's three four-star tournaments uh, in a row, all taking place in Cancun back to back to back. So that's been really exciting. A whole lot of beach volleyball, uh, if you guys are fans of that. And we had some big news just to go over, some top finishes from our European teams. Of course, Rob, I mean, this is the, the best beach volleyball team to watch right now. Uh, Christian, Sorum, and Andres Mold, the beach volley Vikings, taking it the first tournament in a very convincing fashion, beating uh, the team from Qatar, uh, Sharif Samba and Ahmad Tijan in the finals, who actually put up a good fight, but man, Molsar with another victory. Those guys are unbelievable. They are ridiculous. And I don't know all that much about beach. I don't follow it nearly as much as I do indoor, but from someone less educated like myself watching that team, watching the beach volley Vikings from Norway, the just based on the eye test, you can tell that those two dudes are something really special. And they actually just wrapped up a match live like a couple minutes ago as we're recording this, uh, being pushed to three sets by Cardenas and Espinosa from Mexico. So a little home field advantage for those guys taking a set off the like clearly best team in the world. But uh, Mole Sorum did indeed win that match 15-9 game three. So uh, that was going on live. And then there was another upset dam that just happened with some European teams. Uh, that you were just telling yeah, me about. Yeah, Krasilnikov and Stoyanovsky uh, out. Vi uh, not sorry, this is still pool phase, so not they're right. not out of this yet. But still, they they didn't make it that far in the first tournament, and the world number two not uh, winning, losing their first match again uh, in in the second tournament pool phase. So hopefully those two can bounce back as they're you know they've they've pretty much the only team <laughs> to uh, to play uh, Mole and Sorum competitively that we've seen. So hopefully they can get back on track. Yeah, the uh, drop in at 15 12 set three to Bormans and De Groot from the Netherlands. So that, again, just finished up like a couple minutes ago. Yeah. It's cool because for you Europeans watching, you can watch this beach volleyball tournament all day long, all afternoon, all evening, because it starts at probably what, 4 p.m. your time. And you can just watch all afternoon and evening because everything's happening in Cancun. It's cool. I like the bubble of three tournaments back to back to back. There's really nonstop beach volleyball if that's what you want to watch for sure and shout out to everyone in the chat we see tons of messages right now uh good to see everyone good to see some regular faces in there and we will for sure get to uh get to the big match pretty soon uh here just a quick recap of our other top finishers for europeans here uh the new team tillman laborer sinja tillman uh they finished in fourth place in the women's side so you know pretty good for a, for a new team unfortunately no europeans uh medaled in the tournament, the uh, Brazilians and Canadians taking all three of those spots, but very good first impression for the German team, two, two kind of shorter players. So they're very interesting to watch, both of them under 180 centimeters, which is pretty rare uh, to see on the, on the beach scene. And on the men's side, we had uh, Perusic and Schweiner, uh, the gold medal winners at Doha, uh, take third place. And then uh, Pristos and, and Mokara, the Austrian pair taking fourth place. So three of the four, in uh, the men's side, top four finishers were European. So great to see that, very excited for the second tournament. And uh, Rob, let's just go over some of the, what happened in the major European leagues before we get to our, our big show for today, the, uh, 
the preview for Canaliano and Vacas Bank? Sure. So I can't remember exactly what we got to last week versus this week. Um, let's so let's cover the men's league winners really quickly. Um, the Berlin Recycling Volley is winning the German Bundesliga, beating Friedrich Schaap in uh, three straight matches. They had to come back from down two sets to none in the first match. I think they won like 19-17 set five, which was a great match. And then the next two were sweeps. So uh, that was it. Uh, Germany is done for the season with Berlin, uh, who was a Champions League quarterfinalist, winning that league. Uh, Russia is done with Dinamo Moscow winning the championship. I think we might have known that this time last week. I can't remember. Um, yes, we, yeah, we didn't know that. Okay. Uh, France is in the finals right now between Chaumont and Khan. They, I think Chaumont won the first match the other day in a best of three or best of five. I can't remember. But that, those, that finals is happening right now in what's going to be a really good series. Um, Italy men's uh, Lube is up 2-1 on Perugia after Perugia fired Vital Heinem. We talked about that last week. Uh, so... Maybe one more match for Lube to win. <laughs> that, that was that a complete title. blowout. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh yeah. On the weekend. Not yeah. even a little bit close. That was like yeah. just barely over an hour match duration. And that was it. That was crazy. And then uh the big one, Poland. Very, very surprising yes, result. For sure. In in the Plus League on the men's side. Uh Jastrzewski Vagil beating Zaksa Kedrzyn Kozle in two matches. I think three sets to one in both matches to win the Plus League title. So we will have in the men's Champions League Super Finals, neither team that won their domestic league. I'd, I wonder when the last time that was the case was. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's a little surprising. I, I feel like it happened, uh, I wanna say maybe 2013, 2014. Would have to look that up exactly. But yeah, it is uh, surprising <laughs> that neither of those teams, because they're both, especially, I mean, to be honest, I, I did very much think Zaxa would, would win the Polish League. Hats oh, off to, to a strip sheet. They played a very good volleyball. And maybe we'll talk about that more in our right before the uh, the finals next week. But uh, definitely interesting to see. And it goes to show how many good teams there are at the top of Europe. And also, of course, on the women's side, Caneliano taking the title in two games against Navarra. So both Vakif Bank and Caneliano are champions of their league. So it's, it's, just, it's funny how, how both these uh, matchups between men, men and women have kind of turned out so differently. Um, so differently. Like we already talked about that we've been hyping up this particular women's matchup for months and months. And when the drawing of lots happened on the men's side, there is no way I could have predicted this particular matchup. This was <laughs> one of the least likely matchups among teams that really had a chance to go to the finals between Trentino and Zaxa. So yeah, very different. Um, we just said neither of the men's teams playing for their domestic or winning domestic league titles, both women's teams winning their domestic league titles pretty convincingly. Um, I know Vakif Bank beat Fenerbahce 3-2, beat Fenerbahce 3-0, and then the last match was forfeit due to COVID issues. So a little bit of an anticlimactic ending there. But Canegliano, funny enough, had pretty much the same run to the Italian title that they had to get through the Champions League playoffs so far. <laughs> they had to beat they had to beat Scandici, uh, two matches to none, which was the same thing they did in the quarterfinals. They beat Novara, two matches to none, although those were much closer than that same match in the Champions League semifinals. So here they are, both of them having accomplished their domestic goals on the year with only one more match left to win. And it's yes. the one that we've all been looking forward to. And I think that's a good segue. Let's just get right into it. You know, talk for other stuff for 10 minutes. I think it's time to get to the biggest match of the year, Caneliano versus Vakif Bank in the Super Finals, Verona. I, it's so exciting. I mean, Caneliano, 63 <laughs> wins coming into this match. It's crazy. Vakif Bank as well, winning their domestic league and, and barely lost. Um, I don't, do you want to start again with kind of kind of the how these teams got to this point? Yeah, let's do that. So I just talked about a little bit of Canegliano's playoff, Champions League playoff journey. Uh, Scandici pushed them to the brink in that very first match of the quarterfinals, if you remember. Uh, we just did a top 10 video on Canegliano for this season that came out, I think, yesterday. Go check that out. And there's a play in there where Scandici is already up one set to none in the match. Scandici is up 27-26 in set two. And... Uh, a pivotal 
turn like turning point in the entire season really was that Canigliano hadn't been pushed to that point by any team all season long. And there was a ridiculous defensive sequence and Miriam Silla ended up uh, getting a stuff block to really keep Canigliano alive. They ended up coming back and stealing that set. They ended up winning the match 3-2, maybe 16-14 or 15-13, uh, 17-15. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so that was by far the closest Champions League match Canigliano has played all season long. And I remember talking about that on this show or like, okay, how are those two teams going to respond going into the next match in the same matchup could have gone one of two ways. And it turned out that Canegliano really just flipped the switch, kept their foot on the gas and convincingly won the next one, three, nothing. And then in the semis against another Italian team in Novara, uh, we talked about how as good as Novara has been all year, there was just some, kind of mental block or like lack of confidence against a team as intimidating as like a Titanic in, in a, a task to beat a team like Canigliano. And uh, both of those were pretty convincing three O's in the champions league while they weren't quite so convincing in, in Italy the past couple of weeks. So, and all the way back to the fourth round, Canigliano was not touched. They were not touched. There was no doubt that they were going to be one of the very top seeds uh, heading into the drawing of lots. So Vakif Bank, really a similar story, uh, just destroying Police in the quarterfinals of Champions League. But that Busto Arsizio series was electric. That was so unexpected. Uh, Busto taking a match three sets to two, and then Vakif Bank turning around and absolutely destroying them three nothing in the, in the comeback. So that was good enough to advance. But that was a great matchup. And so we've seen both of these teams actually a little bit in Champions League and a little bit domestically, despite never really losing one or losing an important one, getting pushed to the limit. And I actually think that's really important because when you have teams that are this good and have been this dominant for such a period of time, sometimes it, you actually forget what it's like to play a really close match, like to forget what it's like to be pushed to the limit and have to respond. And the fact that both of these teams have actually gotten a little bit of a taste of that in the last month or two, I think is a huge deal. I think it's important for both of them to remember what it's like to really have to dig deep and win a close battle when not necessarily everything is going your way. And that has happened to both of these teams, despite their dominance. Uh, it hasn't been, it hasn't been all like three O's. It hasn't been all just dominant sweeps there. There have been close matches in there. And I think that will, produce a higher, more competitive level of volleyball in the superfinals. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, Dan. But um, the only the only real match loss was that kind of stunner from Vakif Bank against Busto in the semifinals. But uh, then they turned it around and immediately absolutely destroyed Busto in, in the comeback leg through nothing. So that's the type of response that I kind of would want to see from a team like Vakif Bank after that result is coming back and beating them that convincingly. So that's what they did, and it, it gives me a lot of confidence in both teams really heading into the Super Finals because I think they'll both be able to at least emotionally roll with whatever punches the other team throws at them. Yeah, for sure. Okay, my sound should be back, guys. Thank you for letting me know in the chat, as always, helping uh, helping us out with that. But I was just saying, yeah, I agree with Rob that both these teams, uh, they are so good that sometimes they need a bit of reminder that, that they are beatable and they need to play at the highest level. So, yeah, um, but there's, I mean, there's so many interesting storylines to get, get to here, Rob. Um, and I think, I mean, both the teams, I feel like, have pretty interesting lineup decisions uh, because both teams have 
three outside hitters, I feel, right. that, they've, that they've played throughout the season. And, you know, we saw in the finals in Italy, Canigliano go with uh, Mackenzie Adams for most of that second match. So instead of Miriam Silla, who's been the starter most of the season. And on the other side, Vakifank going with uh, Melia uh, as well during, during big stretches of the files instead of uh, uh, Gabby, I, think, I believe, or, or maybe it was Michelle Barch in that last match. But either way, both of them have some interesting decisions to make. Rob, what do you think about those outside hitter subs? Well, we've talked about all year long the benefit that it is for a really high-level European club team to have three really good and reliable outside hitters. Uh, we talked about it on the men's side last week. It's important. It's important for to be able to throw in a different look. It's important to give somebody rest if they're not playing well, if they need a break, if you need um, a better ball controller, if you need a better attacker. Um, that, that third outside hitter spot is something that the really top level clubs are willing to spend money on, even though even if it's a player that's not going to be consistently in the starting lineup, that is an important role. And uh, Mackenzie Adams, American outside hitter for Canigliano, has played a lot this year and has played really well. Um, you wouldn't really be able to tell just by looking at her that she is not a typical starter, uh, plays with a lot of confidence, and I don't particularly think has all that many weaknesses. And the same goes for Vaki Bank. I think they're a little bit more cut and dry with what the starters typically would be on paper with Gabi and Michelle Barchakli. But um, yeah, having that third option for them is huge as well. That That is an important thing. But I think at the end of the day, I think we know exactly the, the starting seven that we're going to get from both of these teams. Um, I do expect Miriam Silla to start for Canigliano in the Super Finals. Uh, maybe Adams comes off the bench quickly. Maybe not. Uh, we'll see. But everyone else, I think we know what to expect. I think that's part of what makes these two teams so much fun to analyze is that we know them so well. We've gotten to know these teams really well, watching them just dominate people over the last year, really. And I think that's what's cool about it. For sure. Um, and guys, yes, we know about the news last night and t this morning that a few of you have referenced in the chat. Um, we're just going to do this, this show assuming that everyone can play and, it, and it's healthy because... I feel like that's more interesting and not out of the question. Um, yeah, but I feel, uh, Rob, I feel like there's one, there's one more lineup question I want to ask you, and that's uh, in the middle for Caneliano, and that's uh, Raffaella Foley or Sarah Farr, because we saw uh, both of them play in the, in the last game for Caneliano, Farr first two sets and then out for Foley. Uh, very different players, Foley, with the veteran presence, a very experienced, very technical, very smart player, where Farr is this you know, young sensation in the middle. Uh, very inexperienced, but playing incredibly for, for how young she is. But at a Super Finals, for one match, do, do you go with a player who maybe has a bit more nerves? That's a tough call. I'm looking at their stats for the Champions League playoffs so far. They've both played almost the same number of sets. Uh, Foley has eight, Sarah Louisa Farr has nine. Um, similar points per set, very similar in blocks, um, really similar attacking numbers, honestly. So statistically, they seem to be outputting about the same in the middle, in that second middle spot opposite of Robin de Cruyff. But you make a good point, Dan, about the the stage. The stage of the Champions League Superfinals is something different. And the level of mentality and preparedness and experience required is a little bit different for that. So for that reason, I think that Raffaella Foley might be the right choice. Or might I, I could see that I could see the coach making that choice. Um, but Farr is an exceptional player too. It really either way. And they either one of those middle blockers will have a tall task. I'm not sure that Conegliano has seen an offense from a blocking point of view quite the style of Vakufank all year. Just the the speed and the style with which Maya Onyanovic likes to gun that ball out to the pins and move hitters around and the way she uses Vakufank's middle attackers might require a little bit of a veteran presence. So that might be the way I would be leaning right now. Uh, but who knows? But they really could go either way. Like I said, statistically, very similar uh, production so far in the Champions League. The, the way I feel about it is that the Vakif Bank blocker, middle blockers, are so physical. 
And Raphael yeah. Foley is a really smart player, but probably far has the bigger size and speed. So I think, yeah, I think uh, Kahar Lee yeah, pointed out in the chat that you need someone to, to match that physicality because um, uh, Zara Gunesh is an absolute monster and I think one of the keys to this game. She will be a lot to handle in the middle, like you said. Uh, Onyanovic likes to run a very fast, very middle-focused offense. And I think, yeah, that's something you don't see as much, I feel like, in the Italian league. So I feel like that's one of the advantages that maybe Vakuf Bank uh, could have. Of course, I want to save a couple points for our, our debate later on. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I agree with all that, Dan. Let's, let's see. So we've got a cool little match report here of kind of the history between the two teams and a little bit more of what got them here. Uh, and I don't think I knew this, but this is a Champions League final rematch from 2017. Yes, yeah. Which, According uh, to the report that we have, which Falkenf Bank won. Um, it was kind of during Conegliano's rise to true, like, elite level of European club. Uh, Falkenf Bank has been there forever. This is their seventh. Uh, they've, they've, won that, they've won this title fifth, five times. They've, they're playing in it now for the seventh time in the Super Finals, which is crazy. <laughs> Unreal. Uh, that's by far a, a record on the women's side in, in all hmm. of Europe. Um yeah, so they, they beat Canigliano in 2017. These two teams played in the semifinals in 2018, um, where Vakif Bank won 3-2. This is back when it wasn't a two-match series. It was just one match. So uh, that could have gone either way, which would have been, which would have been crazy. Uh, let's see. Oh, Club World Championships these two teams played. I didn't know that. Uh, Canigliano beat Vakif Bank 3-2 in the 2019 FIVB Club World Championships semifinals which Canegliano went on to win. So that's very interesting. Vakif Bank has won their last 11 out of 15 Champions League matches against Italian teams. Um, so they've only lost four of their last 15 matches against Italians. One of those was against Busto in the semifinals, though. And Canegliano winning nine of their last 13 Champions League matches against Turkish teams, including five in a row. So... It, that tells a story that we kind of already know. Uh, both yeah. of these teams are pretty much invincible statistically coming into this. Yeah, and, and of course, these teams have history, but, I mean, none of those teams had a Ganu, the Canaliano team. Right, so, that, that's the uh, biggest difference by far. <laughs> a very different, uh, just a bit of an X factor here, Rob. Uh, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> I want to give a shout-out because um, for all the Vakif Bank fans in the chat, we uh, had a couple interviews with Kim Hill. So if you want... Kim Hill, of course, a part of that 2017 Vaca Bank team. Uh, she talks about that as well as, you know, facing the team after all these uh, times. And, of course, uh, Giovanni Guidetti, we did a podcast with him as well. So if you guys kind of want some maybe behind-the-scenes uh, information on, on uh, the players and uh, coaches taking part in this game, then that, the A-Space podcast is a great resource to do that. Um, but, yeah, I, I feel like... Yeah, Aganu is going to be such a difference maker in this one. But also, uh, Vakif Bank has a new addition as well in the Swedish superstar, Isabel Hawk. And uh, Rob, I've gone, <laughs> I've gone all this time without mentioning Isabel Hawk of Hawk of Bank, which I think... Hawk of Bank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a nickname coined on this very show uh, think, by Dan, which I think, I think needs so. to be a hashtag all over the world by now. I think someone, I think uh, Amp, Amp Freights Poseidon brought that up in the chat. And uh, Hanno uh, says, big love from Germany. So Hanno, thank you for the kind words. Man, you guys, there's a lot of chat today, so we're, uh, we're uh, having some trouble keeping up. But if you guys have questions that you want us to address in this part before you know, we get too far into the, uh, into the debate here, then uh, definitely ask those in the chat, and we can get to them and, and have a conversation here. Yeah, so I'm looking at the stats for both of these teams of their Champions League so far, and I'm shocked at how similar they are. I shouldn't be that shocked, but just like seeing the similarity of the numbers is just crazy. Uh, like, for example, let's compare the opposites statistically. You got Paolo Egano for Canegliano and uh, Isabel Hawk for Vakif Bank. Uh, attempts, attack attempts, Egano 140 leads her team by far, the only one in triple digits. Hawk, 152, also leads her team, the only one in triple digits. 
uh, kills. Igonu is 69, Hawk 76. Okay. A- attack percentage, Igonu 49%, oh. Hawk 50%. Efficiency, Rob, Rob, I- can, Igonu can, 31%. Like, can Hawk, we stick on this point a bit? For everyone uh, saying that Iganu is incomparable to Isabel Hawk, throughout the playoffs hey, in the Champions League so far, Hawk they're Hawk, incredibly comparable. Yes, yes, they are, and I think uh, for me, I mean, I understand that you know probably Canadiano runs more out of system through his through Paolo Iganu, but I think Hawk is a very comparable player. At this point, maybe not quite the level, but uh, but definitely, I mean, you see the attacking attempts and the efficiency are basically the same. Yep. Yeah, they're they're being used by their teams in the same way. And I think For that sure. that right there makes them comparable players. And clearly being able to execute and be as efficient as they are in that high volume is why they're at the levels that they're both at, respectively Agonu and Hawk. Now we've talked about opposite a lot. I think we talked about it last week on the men's side. And mm-hmm. I really honestly I believe that the opposite is the most important position in high, high, high level volleyball. Uh, that's been the case on the men's side for years, but it's becoming the case on the women's. That is becoming the player that is, that is your bailout offensive option. When in doubt, throw her a high ball and expect her to score at high efficiency. It's why all of the superstars right now at like age 25 or younger are opposites. You got Egonu, Isabel Hawk, uh, Tiana Boscovich, uh, Melissa Vargas or Fenerbahce, like these ridiculous players at their young ages all opposites and it's the same role that they play on all their teams they are back row options just as much as they are front row options they are by far the highest offensive attempts leaders on their teams they're clearly the points leaders offensively on their teams and there's just an expectation of efficiency that all those players have to have in order for the teams to be competitive they're really being used now the same way that men's opposites have been used for 10 or 15 years now. It's no longer the best offensive player on an average elite team is the outside hitter for women's. It's now the opposite. I think we're clearly seeing that with both of these teams. And you, I don't think you can argue that Igonu and Hawk aren't comparable. They are used the same. Their numbers are almost identical. Uh, their efficiencies are very similar. Um, their skill sets are ever so slightly different. I think Igonu is more of just an absolute freak athlete and Hawk is a little bit more based on vision and range. Uh, she sees the block probably a little bit better. Igonu doesn't really even have to see the block a lot of the time with the way that she attacks the ball. Um, but those are clear X factors. I think if, if one of those players has a noticeably better performance in the superfinals than the other one, that is a massive indicator of who's going to win this match. For sure, I agree, and I don't want to say like that's the only factor or anything like that. But oh, yeah, it's not. But it's if one of them has a good game and the other has a bad game, uh, it's it's going to be yeah. And like like we've seen in a, in a lot of players, I mean, we saw in the Polish league finals, for example, where Camille Semenya, you know, kind of, I don't say he played terribly, but he had you know he had one of his worst games, and, and there's nothing really that uh, Zaxa could do in this situation. But Rob, with the opposites being so important, uh, I think that kind of makes the role of the outside hitter quite different, I would say, than maybe on another team where they become more of a reception uh, specialist. You see, like in uh, Caneliano, for example, they bring in Iganu to hit the uh, through position six a lot of the time, and Kim Hill just uh, is not a back row option at all. So, um, you know, I think that makes the reception part and the serving part, of course, for outside hitters, even more important. Well, I actually think it's a good thing globally in the game for outside hitters because since they're not being relied upon to score at like an opposite level of volume nowadays, they can now focus on more areas of the game. And of course, the outside hitter relied upon, we talk about it a lot, for really five different things. Uh, serving, blocking, attacking, passing, and back row defending. And uh, looking at the passing numbers for these two teams, like Gabi for Vakif Bank is the statistically best passer out of any passer on either team, uh, better than either libero. And uh, Michelle Barch, Kim Hill, very comparable, 35% perfect, 36% perfect, respectively. Or I guess that's passing efficiency, which is a stat that I don't totally understand. (laughs) But I know that 30% is good. And both of them 
like big L1, like prototypical offensive outside hitters, both passing above 35% efficiency is exactly the the shift in that position style in the women's game that I'm talking about. Uh, it's a good thing. And the way that Conegliano especially moves Egonu around a lot, especially out of the back row, uh, you're right. Kim Hill, ha- when she is not in the front court, can focus on first contact only. I think it's good. It makes it makes her team better because of the way that Asia Volosh likes to move the offense around. It's what works for them. And it's less exhausting for a player like Kim Hill. Like we see it with Wilfredo Leon on the men's side. He still is the best offensive option on Perugia. He's going to be the best offensive option on any team that he's ever on. Um, but he has to do more things than an opposite does. And it's just a superhuman task to receive serve to back row defend to have to put on service pressure and also attack balls against three blockers on the left side uh, versus an opposite just has to focus really on scoring points uh i think it's a good shift in the women's game that's um that's becoming a lot more prominent and you see it here with both these teams it's it they're they're phenomenally similar i love how similar they are yeah for sure uh yeah the comparisons between the two scenes is, is a bit crazy um Guys, if you are enjoying the conversation here on YouTube, remember to give the video a like. Um, and yeah, like you said, uh, I think Carla pointed out in the chat that yeah, Gabby is, I mean, she's basically, I would say, a, a libero that happens to be able to hit the ball as well because, and she's so important to the offense, having her as, as basically a second libero and having two absolutely elite passers on back of bank has been so important to their offense this year. It allows Maya to run so much middle and yeah, she, she's been so important. And again, with the outsides becoming less important, I feel like the middles are, are gonna be such a key factor in this game. I would almost say whichever team runs middle more in this game is probably gonna win. She has more middle attempts. I actually like exactly. that take. Yeah, as a, that, well, that's as a, gonna be a, an interesting indicator at the end. Like, well, let's see, let's look at the attacking attempts so far throughout Champions League. Yeah. While you do that, Karhali has a question. He asks, uh, do you have any idea why Italian and Turkish players don't play outside their country's club teams? And I mean, you see, I think you see this not just with Italy and Turkey. You see it with, mo- like, with the Russian players, with, uh, so, yeah, Russian, Italy, and Polish players as well. You don't see play outside the country a lot. Um, yes, it's because the leagues are very strong and they are, you know, they're making enough money. Uh, and the domestic league and, you know, a domestic player with the foreign player restrictions is going to be you know, inherently more valuable in their own league. Uh, the foreign, the foreign player restriction is the big thing. Yeah, uh, I would say if, yeah, if, yeah, that's right. Totally. If if you're an Italian player playing in Italy, if you're a truly like top level Italian player, there is absolutely no reason for you to leave Italy because you're playing at home. Like that's an intangible thing that's important to a lot of players. But you're you're a, even more valuable because of your Italian nationality playing in Italy or the, the same thing in Turkey than you would be otherwise. So. Uh, that's a big part of it, in my opinion. So I was just looking at at middle attacking attempts. Uh, so far, 90 in, in the Champions League playoffs for Vakif Bank. And if I'm counting correctly, 72 for Canigliano in the same number of sets. Oh, okay. So you're right, Maya using that option just a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And, and speaking of setters, uh, Alex, Alexis in the chat makes a very good point that we haven't really even talked about the setters yet, and of course we oh, have... Oh, I knew we would. I knew we would. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I feel like these these two are probably compared a lot online. I feel like two of the best the best setters that we have in volleyball, and, you know, they're both so fun to watch, extremely skilled, extremely technical. Uh, both can easily play their back row options. Both can easily play, uh, you know, they both have these opposites that they're setting up perfectly every time. Uh, what do you think, Rob? Maybe like the are the differences between the two setters, considering they're they're so similar in a lot of ways. It's a great question. So it was funny because I was recording the the top ten video for Canigliano the other night, and it was basically a Joanna Volosh top ten video. <laughs> yes. She is just so ridiculous. And honestly, the Vakif Bank one that I did a few weeks ago was basically a Maya Onyenovich top ten. They're just so ridiculous. The The creativity is one of the things that I think is similar. Uh, in, in situations that are a little bit weird, the, the offensive looks that they're able to manufacture are similar in how creative they are. Uh, it's impossible to 
compare those one to one because the situations when they get weird are so different. But I think one of the biggest differences is how exactly they choose to attack the offense perfectly in system off a perfect pass. So I already talked about Maya earlier. Uh, we, we, we have established that she likes middle a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I also think she wants to run the ball faster. She, I've seen her run these balls to Kim Hill on, or not Kim Hill, uh, Michelle Barch on the left side for Vaki Fink that are middle tempo fast. They are so crazy fast. Uh, she, she generates more one-on-ones than maybe any setter I've ever seen. She is so good at that little look to her right or peripheral vision through the net at what the blockers are doing and understands tendencies so well. And she wants to beat blockers with speed. That's how she wants to generate openings. Uh, Volosh, I think, is a little bit different in that she moves her players around a little bit more. Uh, we've seen Conegliano run outside hitters in on 32. We've seen middle run all over the place, and same thing for Vakabek, of course. But really, it's the way that Volosh likes to move Egonu around. You talked about it, Dan, in the back row, she'll run out of position six, hit the pipe, which Isabel Hawk doesn't really do. Almost no opposite ever does that because <laughs> you have an outside hitter that can do that. Uh, but Agona moves around everywhere. She hits the two ball in rotation one out of the middle in the front row, which is very unusual in the modern game. Um, so it's th there's even the back two, like the inside ball, the Agonu on the right side in the front row that's run sometimes. Uh, that that's Volosh is less of a pure speed setter and more of a misdirection like move players around chess match sort of movement setter in my opinion i don't know if, if that's a crazy take but of all the similarities between those two setters and there are many because i think they're the two best in the world uh the way they attack it perfectly in system like to, to the way they choose to generate space and try to create better matchups is a little bit different for sure. I, no, I think you nailed it, Rob. And, you know, we had some uh, some very good points in the chat as well. Uh, Salim saying, yeah, like both these uh, setters are also a huge threat on two all the time. Yep. Uh, you know, they're, they're, and when they're in the front row, they do do a great job of keeping the middle blocker or whoever is covering them, uh, the left side blocker sometimes, on their toes. So that's, you know, that's that's an underrated part of setting, I feel, because, you know, get one or one or two of those in the, in the first set and, and you really can get in, in your, uh, the blockers' heads. Um, Yuppie also made the point that Maya does, you know, we've seen a couple times in fifth sets where she is subbed out for uh, Yansu, uh, the backup setter for Turkey, who's also a, a big player on the Turkish national team, probably the, the heir to Nas at this point, in my opinion, uh, which I think is fine, because I think Yansu he comes in the fifth set and, you know, provides a very different look for the team, and they have that option to go with someone else at the end of sets. But, uh, oh, man, uh, one thing I want to talk about with this match is that the tactics with two weeks, pretty much, or at least a week and a half to prepare just for this match, I feel like changes the dynamics. And, of course, ever since they knew their opponent, they were the coaching staff of the team has been preparing for this match. So are there any new tactics, Rob? Like, are there, is there anything new you think we'll see from these teams, or is it, is it just going to be business as usual? So part of it is obviously an execution battle. Every volleyball match comes down to that. But I first want to talk about serving. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Serve, serving is another important Serving is, is a huge one. And both of these teams are amongst the very few women's club teams that have at least one or maybe multiple legitimately dangerous jump spin servers. Mm -hmm. uh, Egonu, obviously, for Canegliano, um, Hawk for Vakif Bank, and then a couple others that put on a type of service pressure that is just a little bit different. There, there are good targeted float serves that can that can add pressure, and these teams have those as well. But there's a difference when you're just handling a just just heat, straight heat from the service line. We talked about it on the men's side. Um, that that balance in the men's game is very different serving, of course. But when it comes to a couple green light servers going on a couple stringy runs uh, that could be some, like fighting off those runs and fighting off those truly great servers is something that most of these teams haven't really had to do this year that much. Uh, Canegliano has seen it a little bit with Novara. Micah Hancock's serve is very unique and very dangerous, but in terms of just like a straight heavy 
speed jump serve uh, neither of these two, these two teams are particularly used to having the side out that way i think that's really interesting and then those servers that are not like big jump serve bangers who they target is interesting to me so looking at passing attempts for the teams so far uh for vakif bank i i catch the libero has by far the most passing attempts on her team uh, 96 the next in the champions league playoffs next closest is michelle barch with 66 and ridiculously gabi with only 32 passing Hunt. attempts that's unbelievable she has gotten served one third of the number <laughs> of balls that the libero has and if you don't think that makes dan's point about her basically being a second libero that can also attack the ball um then i don't know what you're listening to right now that is just a ridiculous stat. So if there's one player on Vaki Bank that you do not want to serve, it's Gabi, because not only is she receiving the least balls, she's passing the highest efficiency. So that's why you don't serve her. Uh, she might as well be wearing another libero jersey. Yeah. Uh, but Hill, uh, we already talked about Hill and Barch, uh, very similar in terms of how the percentage of balls that they receive and the efficiency that they receive at. Uh, Monica De Gennaro, the libero for Canegliano, a more a more typical passing role in that she doesn't get served as much because she is probably the best passer on her team. You don't want to serve her as much. Uh, it's her only job, or it's her only job in serve reception, so you don't serve the libero. But for some reason, for Vakit Bank, that's a different story. So that'll be really interesting who the float servers of these two teams go after in the other team's passing units. I think is is going to be something to follow. If Conegliano just goes back and tries to hit their best serve all the time, or if they're more intentional about keeping the ball away from Gabi, like the other teams so far have been. Um, I think you have to keep it away from Gabi. I, even as good totally. as a serving team totally. that Conegliano is, I don't think they can break her. And I think if you're giving balls to Gabi, that means you're going to be running a lot of middle, which is exactly the exact thing that Conegliano uh, wants to avoid his vacuum bank really getting going in, in their middle game. Uh, you know, I feel like a few people are saying uh, Ika Aikash is, is, is bad, which I feel like I, she's been great this season. She's been one of the best uh, uh, receivers in at least uh, European Cup competition. You know, I think, I think she can handle it at this level. I'm not sure. Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, they have Giza Morga as well, who I yeah, know a lot of course. people really like. Uh, that's another phenomenal luxury. They can bring in a, an elite libero off the bench or an elite setter in John Sue Osbe off the bench. So... Uh, that's a nice thing to have for yeah. sure. Who knows how deep this match could go? Like, and just like we said on the men's Dan, there will be one player who on the team that wins that won't necessarily be the superstar that will kind of be the hero, right. It'll like be the I don't know what, what the right term is the X factor, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I guess X factor is a good way to say it. Um, I feel okay, so I'll give my my thought for uh, Vakif Bank, and I think it's going to be you know maybe not a, not maybe a role player. She's better than that, but uh, Zara Gunesh, I think is this is going to be the game where she has to really take take a big role offensively and blocking. I think she's the most physical middle taking part in this game. I think she can if they run you know if they can run the offense through as much as possible, then then that's going to be a huge asset to Vakif Bank's offense. And I think she, you know, if she gets 20 sets in this game, that would be amazing in my opinion. Agreed. She is blowing everybody else in this match out of the water in hitting efficiency. Yeah. A 61% efficiency <laughs> in the Champions League playoffs is just ridiculous. Uh, that is, is, is something that Vakif Bank wants to use and they know that, but it all comes from them being in system. This goes back to the, serving and passing battle that we just talked about. But I agree. I think blocking is an even more important part of Zara Gunish's match and her preparation against a team that has Paula Egonu on it. Like if, if Egonu goes off and hits, I don't know, 35%, 40% efficiency, scores 30 points, you just can't stop that team. As good as Vakif Bank is, you just can't stop Canigliano if – if Egonu has one of those Egonu-like matches, they have to do something to slow her down. It could be service pressure, letting them get a little bit of a better block set up on her. I, I don't know, Rob. From, uh, <laughs> that doesn't dude, seem to matter very much. 
It's an impossible task. It is an impossible task stopping Paolo Iganu. But uh, a couple key, at least block touches. It doesn't even have to be stuff blocks. I don't know. Uh, there, there will have to be a couple great blocking reads and blocking moves made by Vakif Bank to slow Iganu down in key moments. Not stop her, but maybe slow her down. That could be the difference late in sets. I think that is a huge deal. And really the same goes for Canigliano, but I'm very confident in Canigliano's left side block. Uh, I think yeah. Kim Hill and Miriam Silla or Mackenzie Adams are ready. They're, I think they're up to the task to at least take up the right amount of space against Isabel Hawk. I think if I'm one of these teams tactically setting up, if, if I'm Canigliano tactically setting up against Isabel Hawk, I actually want to take her line away. I think that's really where she beats a lot of teams in that pretty like crazy outside shoulder wrist away shot down the line. And she hits it really high. So there's not a lot of a block can necessarily do to stop her, but there's, there's like an, an element of that shot that teams aren't expecting her to be able to hit, especially on slightly inside balls. I really think that Canigliano should commit to just taking that shot away completely with the block. Mm -hmm. If you can make Hawk really strictly pull the ball across her body, sharp cross court to position one, maybe even position two, uh, if you take that one dimension away, I know it, it will sometimes take your setter out of transition offense, but I think that could be a really big deal in kind of compartmentalizing one of the best opposites in the world in Isabel Hawk. And you can't do that against Egonu. The, the same principle does not apply against her. So that is how how Canigliano sets up their outside block against Hawk is really interesting to me. I think you've got to commit to taking away one shot. And in my opinion, you should take away her line. It's, it's, it's her favorite shot. So you're saying, Rob, that you don't trust uh, Monica Di Gennaro on, on that line in position five? Oh, I totally do. <laughs> that, that That's not the thing. And, and it's, it's weird to like funnel the offense or to funnel the defensive plays away from the libero. That doesn't make very much sense. But Hawk hits the ball so deep that if it does get past the block, you're not digging it anyway. It's either over the libero's head or it's inside just to her right. Like the, the as deep as Hawk hits the ball, those defensive plays are impossible to make no matter where you are, unless you're standing at 30 feet, unless you're standing on the end line. So that that's kind of why. I, and it's it's very specific, but I'm curious to see how the Canigliano block sets up to, to defend Isabel Hockey. Because I do think that you can kind of dictate the shot that she hits by the placement of the block, whereas the other way around, you can't do that to Igano. You, you just can't do it. <laughs> yeah, well, I guarantee you the coaching staff have gone through every single attack attempt pretty much uh, by Isabel Hawk and Paolo Iganu. Because you're right, trying to stop those two, or at least figuring out ways to make sure they don't score 30 points on 60% on efficiency is going to be a key in this matchup. Um, just a couple questions that we I think we missed earlier. Georgie asks, uh, Piccinini named Ganu as her successor. Isn't it too early for that comparison? Um, I don't know if there's any player playing right now that I would guess to match, <laughs> match Piccinini's Champions League record. It's probably going to be a Ganu. Uh, just because she already has one at a young age, and maybe if she gets one next week, that's already two. You know. I don't think you can doubt Paula Eganu in any way. Yeah. There is nothing, nothing in, in any length of time that Paula Eganu can't achieve at this point. Yeah, exactly. No, the, the world is, is up to her. And, that, and she's one of those players, whatever team she's going to go to is going to be like a contender. I mean, obviously An she's going to... instant gonna, contender. You're exactly right. She's going to pick top teams. For, uh, and why, should, why wouldn't she? But uh, but whatever team she's on, is, I've given them a good chance of being in the Super Finals. Um, another one, people are talking about kind of the... Uh, Jay Periquin points out, he's talking about the history of these teams, Rob. How much, how much stock do you put in that? Almost none. Because um, okay. like like we said, they, they played before, they played Champions League Super Finals in 17. I guess they played World Club Championships two years ago. That was the most recent matchup. But really, these are different teams. Um, Kim Hill has been there, has been in Canigliano for a while. Michelle Barch has... Wait, Kim Hill was in Vakif Bank at the time, wasn't she? She was with the 2017 <laughs> team that, that won it all with yeah. Zhu Ting. Yeah. So that's very interesting. Yeah, no Zhu Ting anymore, obviously. But there, there aren't that many of these players that were there back in those in those matchups that we were talking about like well before the pandemic 
and uh, most notably, Paola Egonu was not a part of that rivalry. So uh, I think that <laughs> yes. changes the matchup completely. And they haven't seen each other this year is, is the key. Mm-hmm. Like if they, I don't know, if there was some like crazy chance encounter that they had earlier in Champions League or in some other competition this year, it might be a different story. Um, but I don't necessarily see the history of this matchup impacting this. I think it's more of a really competition for who dominates this year because either of these two teams very much have a case for the best club team in the world um dan and i have been arguing this very thing on this show for months now and i think this will finally give us the answer and i think that's that it, the storyline is really about this season in my opinion yeah for sure I, and this teams are there's a lot of movement in the players between these teams there's only a few players left even from like the 2018 and 2019 teams. So yeah, I think, I mean, maybe a little more on Canadiano, but yeah, I think the, the teams are different enough that we can consider this a pretty fresh, a fresh point of view. But Rob, you, yeah, you made a good point that we've been debating these teams all year. And I think that's a good segue into our final debates between these two teams for the season. Um, just let me make sure my mic is okay before we I introduce this debate segment. Or maybe you can introduce it while I figure out this audio. Sure thing. So uh, if you have been paying attention to the show for the last few weeks, we have a little debate segment where we pick a topic and Dan and I take a few minutes each. We state our case and then the chat decides the winner uh, in the form of putting emojis in the chat. So this debate topic is very simple. Uh, It's who is going to win the Champions League Super Finals for the women. And Dan and I are going to stick with our picks from basically episode one of this show and before. <laughs> uh, Dan picking Vakif Bank and myself, I'm picking Canigliano. So if at the end of this debate, you are convinced by Dan that Vakif Bank is going to win this match, uh, I want to see the wave emoji in the chat. And if you believe after my effort to convince you that Canigliano is going to win this match, I want to see the spicy hot pepper in the chat. So. That is that simple. Uh, One of several arbitrary ways that we can perhaps predict the winner of this match is the number of emojis in the chat. So this this has been a long time coming, Dan, that we are finally able to fully debate our winners because both of our picks have made it this far. Not the case on the men's (laughs) side. And Rob, you already got some some peppers. So just but with the introduction, you're uh, (laughs) you're already starting. And I think you went a lot first last time, right? So maybe I should go. uh... I should go first this time. Yeah, I, d- I did go first last time. Okay. Uh, take it away. Why is Vakif Bank going to win this match? Tell me. So, you know, Vakif Bank, one of the most dominant clubs ever in Europe, first of all. They've been there before. They're, they're you know, they're not just the players on the team. The entire staff is experienced. And I think a storyline that's maybe gone a little under the radar here is uh, Canigliano did not play that well in the Italian finals beating Navarra. It was a very close game, and I'll tell you why here, Rob. I'll give you a few numbers. I got some numbers for the debate today. Kim Hill, 18 for 55 in the Italian League Finals and against a worse block than Vakif Bank. Um, Robin de Cruyff, and this is probably the biggest one, 7 for 27 attacking in the finals, not, not even counting her errors. So 7 for 27 from your middle almost completely ineffective. And again, against uh, the Navarra middles, who definitely are not bad, but I would say the vacuum bank middles are going to be an even bigger issue. And, and here's the big thing. Of course, Iganu is one of the best, or if not the best, offensive player in the world. There's no way I can argue that. But the team without Iganu in this Italian League Finals, 76 for 208 for a whopping 40% attack percentage, which... I don't have to tell you, it was terrible. Of course, you had Iganu, who got 60 sets a game, of course. But my point is, is that if they can slow down Iganu or stop her in any way, I feel like Caneliano is going to be very much exposed, and they're not going to be able to, you know, go to another option. They're not going to be able to do anything. So back at bank, just completely lock in on, on, on uh, Paoli Iganu. We've seen her make lots of errors before. That's one of the weaknesses in her game. She does make a lot of unforced errors. So we've seen Vakif Bank play incredible defense this year. Rob, you did the commentary on the top 10. You know like how incredible their back row defense is. And I feel like if they can get a couple of those against Iganu, get a couple of those diving highlight plays, and then uh, run a good transition offense, 
I feel like Leon has no one else to go to right now. So that's why I believe Faki Bank will win the Superfinals. Okay, uh, great points. Uh, I, I like the research going back to the <laughs> Italian final stats. Um, here's here's why Conigliano is going to take all of the, the points that Dan just made and throw them in the trash. And that is because uh, Paolo Egano is the best player in the world first and foremost. Uh, you made the point that if they can slow her down a little bit, they really have a chance. They can't, straight up. Nobody can unless she has an extremely uncharacteristically bad game. There is no amount of strategy or setup or block or defense that can possibly guarantee you that Iganu won't just go off. There's no way that you can do that. Meanwhile, Isabel Hawk, I talked about it a minute ago, it actually is possible to affect the way that she plays based on the way that you defend her. And I think the, the Canagliano coaching staff knows that, and they have a plan for what they want to take away from Hawk and all the other Vakit Bank hitters. Um, you talked about the middle matchup, uh, Vakit Bank having a strength in the middle attacking. I think Canagliano has a strength serving. I, th I do not believe that Vakit Bank will be able to pass the ball well enough to run that middle at the volume of attempts that they're, that they're going to want to, to really win this match and to open up the rest of their offense. Um, I think Conegliano will keep the ball serving away from Gabi. I think they will light up Michelle Barch. Uh, I think that they will put a lot of pressure on from the service line. And then uh, in, in addition to Igona's ridiculous offensive output that you can rely on, also by far the best statistical blocker in this match on either team. So Gabi or Michelle Barch is going to have a gigantic block to contend with. And then the fatigue factor, uh, I think we, we brought it up before that players like Maya and Yanovich, maybe even Aicha Aikach, whoever else, Vakif Bank might run out of gas a little bit quicker if this match goes as long as I kind of expect it to go. I think Canegliano has a conditioning advantage. I think they're a little bit more fresh. They've played more recently. They're in a little bit of a better rhythm after Vakif Bank, Vakif Bank's last match got canceled. Uh, I think they have a little bit more options off the bench in terms of attackers. I think that Mackenzie Adams needs, needs to come in. She can play a great role right away. Uh, I think Conegliano a little bit more complete and way more difficult to stop or slow down. They're going to win this match. It's going to be 64 in a row. And finally, their first Champions League pick. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be I mean, I, of course I want Vakit Bank to win, but the Nintendo 64 uh, winning streak <laughs> <laughs> coming on the Super Finals would be really fun. Uh, thanks, guys, for throwing your emojis in the chat. Um, we'll count these up here, but in the meantime, guys, uh, ask your questions for the last segment on the show. If you have any more questions about this uh, Super Finals matchup that we didn't get to already, uh, ask those, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them before tying up our last show, before, uh, before we all go to Verona. And uh, Rob, I, I think the chat was a little biased today, but so unfortunately. I think they might have been. <laughs> I think, there I, might I think be you made some, some good arguments, but I mean, let's be honest. Our arguments against each other were just, is Hawk going to be, or sorry, is Pauli Ganu going to, you know, score 40 points or 35 points? <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like, she, of course, she's going to be probably the player talked about the most, given, you know, how, how just unbelievable she's been. Uh, but unfortunately, I think this is this is going to be a wave victory. The chat, the chat wants Vakit Bank to win, and I do hope. I think both of us agree that w I think this game will be close. I think it will go four or five sets, and uh, yeah, I'm very excited. Of course, you guys can watch on a Eurovolley.tv. Sorry, guys, not YouTube this time. Also, if you you can watch on Facebook as well, which is something new that we're doing. So you can buy a virtual ticket to a live Facebook Facebook stream which of course, uh, everyone check out, make sure you're not geo-blocked wherever you are before you buy, uh, buy the stream ticket, but uh, there's multiple ways to watch. So you guys uh, for sure can check, ch check those out. And it's like, I don't know about how many Euro it is. I believe it's five US dollars to watch the two greatest European matches of the year. Uh, that's a no brainer, especially given the level of production that both matches are gonna have. Um, you would be crazy not to want to consume those matches. Yeah. Okay, so here's a question from Kahar. Kahar, by the way, you've been great in the chat today. Thank you for putting some very good questions here. Um, he says, who's going to score more, Iganu or Hawk? Oh, uh, man. 
Tough one, eh, Rob? <laughs> Real tough one. Tough one. I'm, I'm trying to just look at the stats and get a little bit of, of help here from the percentages. Like, they've played, the two teams have both played 14 sets in the Champions League playoffs so far. And Hawk has more attempts and more kills and, let's see, points. One more point. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. Uh, 88 to 87. So incredibly tough call. I, I think Egona will outscore her by a little bit uh, because of the blocks and aces category. I think she's more likely to go off in those two areas, but obviously incredibly close. This is just like we talked about about the men's, like just the the play styles and the, the, the closeness of the matchup, like statistically and based on the eye test and all that is, it's about as good of a matchup as we could have asked for. Yeah. It, it's, it's just so awesome. Yeah, for sure. And there's a couple more questions just about uh, logistics in the chat. What day is the game? May 1st. Uh, where can tomorrow. you buy? Yeah, exactly. Where can you buy the uh, virtual Facebook tickets? Go to our Facebook page, Champions League Volley, if you want to get those. Someone just asked, Aleph, hey, Aleph. Uh, Dan, in your opinion, what, what should Vakith Bank do to win? And I, I think I, I've been pretty consistent in saying that they need to run those middles. I think that's the one area where they have the advantage. Uh, Everything else is either a wash or, or maybe even uh, favorable in Kaneliano's favor. But uh, I think the middles will be, are, are going to be such a huge factor with Milina Rasic and Zara Gunish. Uh, so if they, if they can really get that going, then I think that's going to be Vakif Banks' uh, key to victory, which is different from Emoko's, in my opinion, which is uh, just have, a, you know, play good defense and give it to Aganu and get her, get her 35 points on, on 60, 50, 60% hitting. I think Canegliano's just got to pass nails. Yeah. If they pass, if they pass the ball, great. I think that there is nothing Vakovic can do to stop them from winning this match. Uh, serve and pit. This is like the closest thing to a men's match that I've ever seen in terms of how important the serve and pass battle is going to be. Yeah. I, that's actually kind of cool. Actually, so one one thing I wanted to mention back when we were talking about it is uh, Isabel Hack actually has not been serving that well recently. I feel like she's dropped off a little bit since the beginning of the season. Uh, she's she has been making quite a few errors and not really putting the pressure on. I feel like as much as the beginning of the season where she was absolutely sensational from the service lines. So I think I think she's one of the biggest game changing servers in this match. Potentially she can serve it very strong with that with that jump serve. But if she goes back and we, we've seen this with Perugia, I feel like during the Italian playoffs, if your key servers go back and and miss the whole time, that is absolutely devastating for it's your ability to, to get those break points yeah totally yeah you, you've got to get break points to win volleyball matches just straight up you have to find a way to score points on your serve against canigliano are you going to stuff block balls are you going to get block touches and then dig them and turn them into transition offense or are you going to just serve aces that those are the three really main ways to try and score points on your serve and if vodka bank isn't putting on a ton of service pressure all three of those things become incredibly difficult. For sure. Uh, Georgie asked, does Moko have an advantage considering the match is in Italy? Um, in a normal with, year, yes. Yeah. This year, no. Yeah, which so is too year. bad. I really wish. I mean, people, just reading the chat, I can tell how many like incredibly passionate fans there are of these teams. And I, I really wish you, everyone could have gone. Unfortunately, that's not, oh, the, way, yeah. the, that's not the way. The atmosphere just won't be the same. Yeah, but uh, we'll try and do some extra stuff for you guys and get lots of content out there. Um, Sardar asked, so, do you think the... Somebody, oh, somebody asked a guitar question in the background. Uh, <laughs> is, my, is, the, is the guitar on the wall a Gibson or an Epiphone? Uh, it's a Gibson. It's called an SG Modern. I love that guitar. Uh, follow me on Instagram if you want guitar stuff. This is not the time to talk about that. Yeah, Rob's a great musician as well, if you guys didn't know. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, in terms of block, who provides more blocking? Uh, I would say... For me, for sure, Vakif Bank, especially given the way DeCroyf has played. And, you know, they can't even decide between Sarah Farr and Raphael Foley right now. Definitely middle blocking. Vakif Bank's got an advantage. Uh, Hawk is a disgusting blocker on the right side. She's so good. So is Egonu. Uh, both have very good size, like L1 players. Um, Gabi is definitely, her purpose is not to be a blocker so much. So that actually might be a really interesting matchup. Yeah. See if Egonu can pound the ball down the line when Gabi's blocking. Uh, yeah, I think you're you're on the money, Dan. That Vaka Bank has a middle advantage a little bit in just about every area, um, but uh, everything else here is a toss up at best for Vaka Bank. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, Sardar asks another question here. Great questions, guys. Thank you for getting all these in the chat. Yes, do you think the efficiency of outsides and middles will be something that will turn the match results? I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <For sure>. uh, <laughs> I don't know if we need to even say much more about that. Hitting, I've, I've, I've preached the, the importance of the hitting efficiency stat on this show many times. And it's the most important offensive stat there is, straight up. So the team yeah. that hits more efficiently, you can break that down by position groups if you want, but really the team top to bottom that hits more efficiently is almost definitely going to win the match. But, but at the same time, Rob, I feel like efficiency for one match isn't, isn't quite the, as important as, you know, say, over the course of the season. Because you think about it, a 10% difference in efficiency can be, you know, one or two missed you know missed hits right or or even especially because efficiency doesn't always capture the results of your hit right um, yeah because because there's more like a team like zoxa kedrus and Kojley, for example has more attempts like that they're not necessarily trying to score on offensively they're just trying to produce something positive to swing the point in their favor good point maybe we should look at like side out percentage is a little bit of a better yes. number for one match yeah. Uh, that is influenced, of course, by hitting efficiency. But I wonder if we would be able to break that down between side out and transition. Because those yeah. are often extremely different numbers. Uh, oh, teams at sure. this level sh should be siding out at 70% at least. And if you if you fail to do that, you're probably not going to win the match. But transition hitting offense is, is a much lower number almost always. So it would be cool to break that down, break those two things down. In, in one match, that's a good point, Dan, those two numbers as a team, which is not all about offense. It's about scoring points in those situations. Uh, it might be a little bit of a better indicator. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I think you nailed it. And yeah, I think people maybe we miss sometimes that, yeah, how different side out offense versus transition volleyball is just in general. It couldn't it's, it's be like a, more different. Like teams don't practice, they practice those two things separately. It's it's completely different uh, areas of the game, which because they, they do look the same to especially to most viewers, so I can see why people get it mixed up sometimes, but they are different. Rob, last question for today. Michelle Barsh or Kim Hill, who's better? I'm, I'm letting mm. you take this as the, as the American. I like that matchup a lot. Uh, both great stories, both like similar players, honestly, in my opinion. Hill playing for Vakit Bank before, now in Canigliano. Oh, it's such a tough call. I, I, I think I have to give it to Kim Hill by a very narrow margin. Um, I, I don't think there's any area of her game that can possibly be exposed. I think her her ability as a left side blocker is going to be really important in this match. And uh, Michelle Barch has a little bit more weight on her shoulders offensively than Hill does. That like Hill can obviously score you 20 points in a match, no problem. Uh, but it's not necessarily expected of her match in and match out where for Barch, I believe it is. So there might be a little bit more pressure there. Uh, tough call. I think they're both phenomenal players and they're, they're really one another's mirror for these two teams, but I would give a very narrow advantage to Kim Hill. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I probably would as well. You guys, the American national team, very lucky to, uh, to have both <laughs> on the team at the same time. Not everyone yeah. is, is, uh, is that lucky. Um, but thanks everyone for joining the chat on today's show. I think that Rob, I think that was like probably the best chat that we've had, uh, I think ever. <laughs> yeah, chat, you guys are awesome. I'm always bringing the heat this week and, and every other. I'm, I'm excited to see so many people so excited about this, this match, the women's match and the men's match from last week. Uh, again, just like I said last week, we, we looked at our viewership numbers, which are amazing, by the way. I love that everyone's watching the show. But there's a huge percentage of people that watch the show that are not subscribed to the CEB YouTube channel, which is crazy. So subscribe to this channel. Uh, top 10 videos, this show, live matches on several occasions. Uh, there's so much stuff that you don't want to miss. So subscribe so you don't miss it. Yeah. And guys, next week we have, I mean, the Super Finals is a week away. So if you guys didn't know, we will be doing a show next Friday, the final, the final, final, final <laughs> preview. And that one, we'll hopefully we'll get some, uh, you know, talk about the very recent additions, what's going on on the ground, what's going on in the court. I will be joining live from Verona. Rob, wish you could be there, but unfortunately. Me too. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately not. So definitely, guys, check out next week's episode. 
Uh, it might not be at five o'clock, uh, it's still to be finalized. So uh, just watch during the morning or, or the day before or earlier in the week. We'll try and get the message out to you guys uh, exactly when it's going to take place. Um, yeah, definitely join that one because it's going to be one day before the Super Finals and that's very exciting. And of course, we're going to be having interviews with the players on the YouTube channel as well. We're going to be having highlights, of course, if you're unfortunate, you're not able to watch the game. And yeah, just it's going to be a weekend of incredible volleyball. Yeah, stay tuned. There's a lot of content to consume. I love hearing from the individual players about just how different it is to play in this particular match versus any other match. I'm excited to hear all their thoughts about that. I, I think a lot of them are going to try and downplay it, but we all know that 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 the, the Champions League Super Finals is the match. It's This is the thing that you play for in club competition. Like it's the biggest title. It's the thing that teams look for, forward to all year. And all four of these teams that are playing are, are going to give everything they have to win that cup. It's going to be awesome. And that is a fantastic send off, Rob. So we will see all you guys right here again next Friday.